Bom dia para quem é de bom dia, boa noite para quem é da boa noite, boa tarde se você acabou de chegar no YouTube e está vindo para mais uma entrevista do Bate-Papo Mayhem e hoje sim você leu corretamente, a gente está hoje com o Thomas Carlson, a gente está muito nervoso porque esse é o cara que traz o livro da Clifa, primeiro trabalho publicado seriamente sobre o assunto aqui no Brasil e... Bom, a gente vai conversar, né? Não, não vou adiantar nada, mas antes de vocês ler, você precisa ligar aqui a legenda e depois colocar aqui do lado Translate to Portuguese. E o YouTube vai gerar as legendas. And now we are moving to English. Well, I would like to welcome Mr. Thomas Carlson. You are a legend here in Brazil. Thank you so much for your time for being here in this interview. How are you this day? I'm fine, and thank you for inviting me to this interview. Uh, Brazil means so much for me. Uh, I love Brazil for so many reasons. Uh, it is one of the countries where I think we will see uh, good changes in the near future. The time right now is very tough. It's tough for everyone around the world, but uh, Brazil uh, has a long tradition of working with parallel spiritual systems, uh, which I think make uh, it's no coincidence that uh, we have many members in, uh, uh, in Latin America uh, in general and uh, Brazil in particular. And uh, there is a long, long, several hundred years Uh, connection between the, the Scandinavian countries and Brazil. So, uh, so for me, it, it means a lot, and I'm very happy that uh, I, I see how, how we grow uh, as an organization in Brazil. And uh, I think I think we just see the beginning of it, and that uh, in the future, uh, the draconian work. Uh, will have a huge impact on the development of spirituality in Brazil. Well, well, thank you so much for being with us. And the first question that I always ask our guests is about your journey. And how did you begin? How was studying magic with no internet and anything like that? And how did you choose each step of the way uh, until here? And if you could talk about a little bit about your, your relation with the Therion and the Dragon Huji. It can sound a little bit, um, how to say, uh, in, in one way, I don't think I ever had the chance to not uh, be part of this path. My first memories in life was uh, uh, out of body experiences. And uh, I was about three years old. And uh, to a so young child, it was no difference from uh, other experiences. So I uh, uh, felt that this, this is completely natural. Uh, and uh, it followed me. So uh, uh, the astral. Uh, experience and astral projections was uh, present uh, as a normal thing uh, in my uh, uh, upbringing. Then when I become uh, like 12, uh, I, I get over a book in, uh, in school about supernatural uh, phenomenon. And then I uh, read about astral projections and uh, I was, aha, this is something not everyone has. It's considered a cult. It's even considered uh, a little bit yeah, dangerous that if you work with astral projections, you also work with a cult. Uh, but to me, it was just about, wow, uh, this is uh, my cup of tea. Uh, so uh, I started very early to, to read everything I could uh, come across about uh, the occult. So, uh, I used Ouija board, I uh, bought tarot cards, started to study tarot, started to study Kabbalah, started to uh, study the, the uh, orders that were around, it was shamanistic orders, 
which groups. It was uh, OTO, Golden Dawn, uh, all these famous organizations. But I felt that it was something important missing and it was the dark side because most of the system work with the premise that uh, we are, so to speak, in, in, in a darkness as in the meaning uh, uh, that we are uh, not illuminated and that the path is to step by step go out of this cave of, uh, of uh, lack of knowledge until we go out in the clear day and there we maybe find God or, or, or whatever. But to me, I felt that this is part of the truth. Definitely, this is part of the truth. Like it's time for a paradigm. The real occult, and that is the dark side. It is what is behind us. It is what is below us. It is, uh, it is uh, the, the things that have been considered as diabolic, uh, the realms of the devils, and the realms of demons, the, the different levels of hell. And that fascinated me a lot. Then I also came across, since my father was an intellectual atheist, uh, he didn't believe in religions at all, but, but he uh, was very interested in uh, quantum physics and uh, he was a uh, research uh, boss for the uh, computer company uh, IBM. So uh, he taught me quite early about, uh, for example, um, uh, the quantum physics. And uh, then I also started to be interested in fractal mathematics and then the ideas from Mandelbrot that we live in a four dimensional reality of time and space. That's we, we have the room, it's the th three dimension, and then we can move in this room and we grow, we become older and uh, uh, in the end die, that's time. But according to Mandelbrot, which is more or less now accepted by every scientist around the world, there are 11 dimensions, which means that seven dimensions are hidden for uh, mankind. And those dimensions is the focus of my work with Dragon Rouge and the Draconian Path to unveil, to, uh, to uh, uh, uncover uh, these hidden dimensions at least as a beginning, the fifth dimension, because we are already a uh, dimension. Because at, as we do right now, we are speaking here from different parts of the planet. It's huge geographical uh, distances. It's also dif uh, differences in, in time zones. Uh, so already with a meeting like this, we are challenging the rules of time and space. But then we have also the possibility to, uh, in ourselves, uh, enter into a fifth dimension where we can look at time and space a little bit from above. We look at uh, time and space from an eagle perspective. And that also helps us to understand life and it helps us to understand time, and it helps us to understand death. And it also has the keys to uh, the secret of what is beyond death and how can we deal with death in the most constructive way so that instead of being our main enemy, uh, the death can become our ally. And that is a bit of, of my mission I uh, sworn pacts, made, made uh, pacts with, with the forces to, uh, to uh, make people uh, understand and become interested and, and start their own journeys uh, to, to uh, uncover these hidden dimensions, because that will make us uh, receiving so much more knowledge 
about existence. Then we also have the fact that we live in our universe with all its galaxies and solar systems and so on. It's maximum 5% of, uh, of the material world, 95% uh, is dark matter and dark energy. And it is there we should try to look for uh, the intelligences that is far more intelligent than we human beings. And there we can find the demonic allies that can help us uh, on our uh, existential path of life. And how did you came in contact with the Dragon Rouge? Uh, it was quite easy because I founded it. So I'm the founder of Dragon Rouge. Yes. Uh, and uh, it was a lot of different things that came together, which I also describe in my book, Amongst Mystics and Magicians in Stockholm. Uh, I went to a completely weird travel to Morocco, uh, actually because I wanted to go to Mali uh, and study the Dogon tribes, uh, because I was very fascinated by the, them after reading a book called Serious Mystery by Robert Temple. And according to him, the Dogon tribe uh, had visitors from, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, other dimensions or uh, fr from, uh, uh, from space that gave them knowledge about, uh, about uh, a lot of things that uh, become uh, discovered much later uh, by uh, the Western world. Uh, and to me, this matched completely with the idea of the fallen angels. The fallen angels, it's the biblical name for it, but uh, some people may prefer to call it aliens or whatever. <laughs> I, I think uh, the concept of the fallen angels is good because there is a lot in the Bible and in the biblical tradition that we can learn from, but we must a little bit read it with the devil's eyes uh, to understand the underlying meaning of the, of the story of Genesis and the fruit of knowledge to understand the travel of Henoch to understand uh, the story of the fallen angels and the ne Nephilims and the giants. But we see these uh, patterns in uh, all cultures. We find it in India, in China, uh, not least in the Nordic Germanic uh, tradition. Uh, so this is a universal uh, store of something that gave birth to our high cultures. Uh, because man lived for millions and millions and millions of years, more or less uh, the same. But then, bam, quite uh, at the same time, uh, th this high culture grew up in Egypt, in Indus, in India, in, in parts of China, in, in Mesopotamia, and so on. And people learned to write, which was a great discovery, because then we could uh, instead of need to learn everything uh, over and over again, we could start to collect knowledge and get this cumulative effects of, of, of collecting knowledge. And we could start to build in a way that we had, couldn't before. We made extreme advancements in medicine and in uh, astronomy, in the geometry, in math and so on. And I would say uh, the myth of the fallen angels uh, is actually about uh, the birth of uh, the human civilizations. Now I don't no. remember really what was the question, but... Uh, <laughs> How did you come to the idea of founding the Dragon Rouge? And uh, as Daniel asked then, how did music yes, that goes. Our philosophy? Yeah, we, we can start with the, with the very idea of how I found the Dragon Rouge. I went to Morocco and uh, never came uh, over the Atlas Mountains. Uh, so we stayed in Marrakesh, a very fascinating uh, uh, town in uh, Morocco. And the guy I traveled with was all the way uh, away 
doing his uh, weird businesses. I don't need, I don't know today what he was actually doing, but I have my theories. Uh, but I was sitting alone at the cafe and uh, I was at a, a square called the, the Square of the Sagas or the Fairy Tale. And you see everything there with uh, this so enchant uh, serpents with the pipe. Uh, you see a lot of the people selling selling uh, uh, beautiful clothes, uh, uh, different uh, incenses, uh, herbs, and so on. And I was sitting at the cafe, and then suddenly came a guy to me that was obviously not a beggar, because there was a lot of beggars as well. But he was very, looked very sharp. And uh, even if he was uh, dressed in the traditional Moroccan clothes, he looked at me and then he started to speak French. And my French is not so good, so he switched to English. And then I was sitting there, 17 years old, uh, wondering about why there isn't any order that is dealing really with the dark side. I know of, about Temple of Set and had certain contacts with them. Uh, I know a little bit about the Kenneth Grant, but it, it was still that I felt there is something, there is a hole that can be filled. Uh, there can be, there, there is something that must uh, take a step uh, ahead. And then this man looked me really deep in the eyes and he said, old temples will fall. New temples will be built. Temples to the red dragon. And I was completely shocked by all of this because I haven't talked about the red dragon with, with like anyone. So is this a joke? Is it, what, what is this? Is he trying to sell anything? But then he just disappeared. And I was sitting alone there with my, my Moroccan tea uh, or if it was coffee, I don't remember. Uh, I was really about old temples will fall, new temples will be built, temples to the red dragon. So when I went home after a very turbulent uh, fight with this guy I, I, I traveled with, I came finally home to Sweden and then I decided uh, together with some uh, friends who I practiced uh, occultism with, that we should found the order Dragon Rouge. And we wanted to name it not after any specific cultural god. So instead, some gods, uh, some orders are called Temple of, and then some specific uh, god from a spe specific culture, or Church of, yeah, the like Satan. Then you are in the, in the biblical tradition. But I saw that this is universal. This is something that is the same, no matter if you uh, work in, with magical in China or in India or, or in any part of the world. Uh, so we chose a symbol instead of, a, of a, a specific name. And the red dragon is the symbol of the optimal forces that was both before creation and is always inside creation and will also exist after creation because it's uh, completely beyond time and space. And as it has been told, in the end, dragon will devour even death. So even death will die uh, in the mouth of, of the dragon, but the dragon can also give the elixir of life to the, to the adepts. So that was the start of my journey. Then, uh, uh, after like one year, it came quite quick, uh, since this in some way coexisted with, with uh, the subcultures of the light, late uh, 80s and early 90s. Uh, I myself, for example, I listened a lot to, to Venom, uh, Merciful Fate, uh, Battery, and bands like that, because uh, it inspired me in my uh, occult work. So even if uh, it was not that, that these bands were 100% serious, it still was uh, something that, that I listened to and it inspired me. And then it came quite much uh, members into Dragon Rouge. So obviously we filled a gap. And uh, uh, 
many of these members came from the metal scene. Uh, so uh, then I met uh, Christopher Johnson, who is uh, uh, yeah, the, the leading person of, uh, of the band Therion. And uh, we became good friends. And uh, then after uh, a couple of years, he uh, asked if I could start to write the lyrics for Therion because he felt that if someone can write the lyrics for Therion, it's, it's me because I'm the one who knows most about the occult. So then it was a long cooperation for many, many years uh, with Therion, which uh, still is a great band. Uh, so uh, yeah. then I also started to work with other bands, uh, the band uh, Shadow Seeds. Uh, I worked with uh, Necrophobic. Uh, I worked with, uh, and worked today with, with bands as Offer Mood, uh, Serpent Noir, uh, Deva Thorn, and so, so uh, music is very important for me. Uh, I would say that music is perhaps the language that is best suited for uh, understanding uh, the supernatural uh, aspects of existence. Because music, even if we speak, you know, okay, we speak English now with each other, but no one of us has English as our uh, native language. Uh, and no matter uh, uh, what, where you come from or, or uh, your language, when you hear certain kinds of music, it will happen things in the brain, it will happen things with emotions, with ideas. So uh, music is an extremely good uh, source for occult knowledge. So that's why uh, we usually say that our magic in Dragorosh is closely connected to music. But then we also uh, see the importance of uh, uh, physical manifestations of, uh, of uh, the draconian path. So, uh, so uh, that's why we also encourage members to practice uh, martial arts, uh, because then you can learn about how to move your body, how to control that so called Kundalini flow in, in your body, how to breathe uh, uh, in the right way. Uh, and you can also experience a lot of these uh, energies that's in the body, because the red dragon is something that's outside us, beyond our understanding, but we also have it inside us. Uh, so we are like a spark of the dragon. And uh, martial arts is a very good way to, uh, to uh, learn about the energies we have uh, inside us. And also about our psyche, uh, how we, we uh, can handle uh, situation uh, as we are taught uh, in martial arts. So music, we used to say magic, music and martial arts. It's our 2M. <laughs> but then all kinds of art is interesting and uh, all kinds of sports is good. But, uh, but uh, yeah, this has been a little bit of, of uh, uh, the focus in, in Dragon Rouge. Well, I think this was the perfect answer. So I'll ask you the, our first question, that is, based on what you said about the music and martial arts and magic, what is magic to you? Magic is strongly connected to the principle of will. And the more we grow on the magical path, the more we understand how complex the will is and that it is very hard to uh, manifest our will. Uh, th so the magical process is very much about uh, creating the fire of will to uh, uh, reach illumination and also power over our own lives, perhaps even after death. Because we can see we have two pillars. One is complete chance. It's like there is no uh, connections. Everything is just chance. 
and in such a world, it's impossible to have a, a wheel because everything is just, yeah, chance. On the other hand, we have the idea that everything is determined, that everything is like a mechanism. So uh, we are just part of the mechanism and every, when we think we, we uh, uh, want something, it is already determined in the body before we, we uh, uh, and, and uh, we, we uh, think of it as a free will. It's been a lot of studies about that, that uh, it had turned out that, that it seems like we have very little free will in reality. And that's, of course, a very complex situation because all our legal system, for example, is based upon the idea that we have uh, the possibility to choose one thing and, uh, and not choose another thing. Uh, so we have these two pillars. One is chance, completely chance. There is no possibility for free will. Then we have the other pillar of to complete determination, like a, 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 everything is like mechanic. And even there, it's no possibility for a free will. So what we do is to navigate between those extremes because there we can transcend and then receive uh, a free will. And when we receive a free will, uh, we will reach what was uh, said in Genesis, in, in the Bible, in the third chapter, chapter and the fifth verse, uh, the serpent tell that we will, uh, we will see and we will become as gods. So magic, I would say, is uh, will, but it's also a path. So uh, uh, magic in itself is a journey and uh, it's journey that best is uh, going on uh, in company with uh, like-minded people or people that you can work together with. In one way, it's, it's a very lonely path, but on the other hand, you need other people also to improve uh, yourself uh, because you learn from other people and, uh, and uh, you can help each other. So I sometimes say that, that to become good in a martial art, it's very hard if you just uh, practice it alone and from reading books. You must go to a martial art club uh, to, to, to learn martial arts for real. And the same is with magic. Then meeting today can be via Zoom or Skype and so on, because we live now in a new reality with a lot of great tools uh, that make it possible to, uh, to work together from all parts of the world at the same time. Well, this is, the, as magic is a journey is very beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and in your book, you said uh, it's Kabbalah, Clifford and Goetic magic. So for our audience in Brazil, what do you how do you define the Clifford? What is Clifford to you? Yeah, yeah very good. Uh, that was something I was really missing when I uh, studied more conventional uh, occult books. It was that they mentioned Clifford very briefly and very superficial. So I started to read more academic books about Clifford, for example, Gershom Scholem, who was professor in Kabbalah. And when I started to read the more academic books, it showed another uh, aspect of Clifford that was far more interesting than anything I read in the conventional occult books, because uh, it turned out that Clifford has been seen as uh, dar a dark mirror of existence, that it is the really Sitra Ara or Sitra Achra, uh, the other side, uh, that it's perhaps this world that's older than our world, and that it's uh, 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 in Clifford resides uh, intelligences that is of crucial importance for us to get the guides to uh, fulfill our journey on this, uh, this uh, 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 road of, uh, of uh, ex existence. And the Clifford has sometimes been called the shell. And I usually say that look at Botticelli's uh, Birth of Venus, because what the Clifford does 
is that they nourish a pearl and then they open up and release Venus love and beauty. So uh, first, uh, the Clifford is extremely terrifying because they have monstrous shell. And, uh, and uh, uh, when you work with it in the beginning, it, it's completely terrifying. And all the old school uh, work that you should command the demons in the name of God is completely useless if you meet these demons in reality, because they are so far above our own intelligence. So we must just respect that they are uh, above us in intelligence, but that they also can be great guides as the, a good teacher. Uh, and then uh, Clifford become uh, worlds of, of learning and where we go step by step by step until we reach uh, the level, levels beyond time and space and levels where we become like gods. And here I would say, this is not easy. There are some people out there who say that you can become a god, like now in a few weeks. Uh, you know, I'm more leaning towards the, the Indian tradition who say that it can take billions and billions of years until you reach uh, the goal. But the good news is that time anyway don't exist from the fifth dimension. So these billions and billions of years get a completely other uh, uh, meaning when uh, you have reached the fifth cliff of the black sun, because there time anyway don't exist, but it is not an easy process and we shouldn't lower the meaning of God. So it, it, like in some kind of Satanism, it's like, ah, but God is, I, I, I am already God. Uh, I just uh, must realize it and, and uh, and uh, I will do what I, quite a vulgar interpretation of Crowley's uh, do what thou wilt, that people instead uh, interpret it as do what uh, I want or uh, uh, yeah, do what I, I wish. Uh, uh, because uh, if you read what Crowley, Crowley uh, really means, it, it's, a, it's a part that demands strict discipline and uh, it's not about just doing what one uh, feel for or want. So um, Clifford is, uh, it's a revival of the old mystery cults that has been operating in the shadow that uh, instead of, of uh, striving just up towards uh, higher levels of light, it's instead explore the tunnels that is the very foundation of existence. So instead of, of just uh, trying to uh, discover the 5% of the light universe, uh, for the magician who's interested in Clifford, we want to discover the 95% uh, of dark matter and dark energy. And what's interesting here, is that this uh, dark energy and dark matter, uh, it's not only uh, something that is uh, material, we find it also on the spiritual level that uh, it is the same because outside creation and even outside the realms of, of the gods and angels, there is the this vast ocean of darkness where the dragon resides. And it's there we can find the true keys to the mysteries and to illumination. I see. Uh, I have a question, but before I ask this, I have yeah. one that's, uh, what's the importance of being baptized in the church? How does it affect you? And how does it impact the dragon Rouge in some ways? It's Darcy's question. And then after that, I will ask mine. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I must really uh, emphasize that it didn't affect Dragon Rouge at all. It was only a personal thing uh, for me. But um, uh, we are, Sweden is the most atheist country in the world. Uh, so religion in Sweden is really like a kind of non-question. Uh, if 
you know, like in the United States, uh, the president always are supposed to say, God bless America. But if we would go to Sweden and the prime minister would say, God bless Sweden, all Swedes would believe that have he become some kind of crazy fundamentalist uh, uh, wacko. So um, uh, in, in Sweden, we have a, it's very secularized and very atheist. The thing that Swedes consider to be God is often nature. There have been a lot of studies that, that going out in nature is, is uh, where both Swedes feel that they, they uh, meet, meet something higher, uh, a higher meaning. Uh, but for me, since I studied uh, the esoteric Lutheranism uh, of uh, Johannes Bereus, uh, I realized that I had so many uh, lack of knowledge about uh, my own cultural uh, tradition that even if I'm not uh, like conventional Christian, it still influence uh, our culture and there is a treasure there that's hidden because there are so much uh, magical gems uh, hidden in the church. So to get access to those uh, magical aspects of the church, I decided that I, I go through this experience of be, be, being baptized in the church of Sweden. And it was a beautiful experience, but it doesn't mean that I've changed my path. I would say that it was just uh, one step on my path and it was something that was very beautiful, but it hasn't made the Dragarouche Christian in any way. Uh, so, but, but I discovered, for example, in, in, uh, uh, in the typical Swedish hymns, uh, religious uh, uh, psalms and hymns, uh, uh, there is always this, that, that it, it, it's kind of nature mysticism, that, that God is somewhere there in the trees, in the forests, uh, in the wilderness. And it's quite appealing. So, so I wanted to, yeah, my baptism was a way to come in contact with my own roots as a Swede. Right. Uh, the, the, the but reason it does not influence Dragon Rouge at all. Now, this is, is Swedish news. Okay. This is Swedish tobacco. Mm. That's the reason why Sweden has less smokers in the world and less cases of lung cancer in the world because. Um, uh, more or less no one uh, smoke in Sweden, but everyone used this Swedish snus instead. <laughs> oh. That was a little sidetrack or excourses. Oh. Great. The reason I ask you that is because uh, when, when the, the new, this news came to Brazil, we, are, we have several people here that thought, think that uh, the Clifford is evil and to study Clifford you must become evil. For example, yeah. if you study Samael, you must become a liar. And yeah. so if you study Clifford, you will become an, an evil person. Yeah. And then when they said that you converted to a Christian church and then they said, oh, so now Thomas Carlson is not evil anymore. <laughs> so, so what are your thoughts between uh, Clifford study and, and evil? I would say that uh... <clears throat> In one way, it's opposite because what we are doing when we study Clifford is that we're studying the dark and destructive forces of existence, but it's not for the reason of becoming destructive or destroy ourselves or our, our surroundings. I would say that see it as when you go to a gym, when you do push ups and when you do uh, sit ups, it's actually destroying the muscles a little bit. Uh, but you don't do it because you want to destroy your body. You do it because you want to be stronger. And that's the same with Clifford, that uh, uh, when we work with Clifford, we challenge uh, different aspects of existence that will make us stronger and stronger for every initiatory step we take. But to try to become evil, that is, uh, I would find a very childish or, or uh, that, that's definitely so far from Dragoosh uh, 
uh, how we look at Clifford. We have even criticized some groups that uh, romanticize suicide and so on. We rather see uh, uh, that life is something we should, uh, uh, we should really, we are on a bat life is a battlefield. We will anyway die someday. It can be by a car accident or it can be uh, by a disease or whatever. We fall in the, in, when we shower and then we break our neck. Uh, we never know. So that's why we rather should try to become stronger so we can help uh, people around us and ourselves on the very tough path that life is. Because uh, life is a very hard path. And uh, what Clifford does, it makes us stronger so we can deal with this tough reality uh, in the absolute best way. Perhaps even in a way that will make our consciousness survive death. It's like a great answer. It is lo it's lovely that you have it translated. So finally, we can talk, talk to some people that, well, Clifford is not a bad thing. Because it is uh, something, I don't know if it's just in Brazil that we have this. Have you ever heard people are trying to be uh, the bad guys and everything because they're studying Clifford? Uh, or it's just yeah. a Brazilian thing. No, no, no I, I've seen it in, in almost every country. Uh, not to speak about the, the, the infamous Norwegian church burners of the 90s. Uh, that a little random killed people and they burnt down churches. And uh, today, they either are still in prison or they have regretted it deeply. And uh, it was definitely uh, just that they were lost. Uh, so Dragon Rouge filled a very important uh, uh, role during the early 90s because people who otherwise could have been quite self-destructive or destructive for their, their surrounding find the path where they could channel all this energy into something that is constructive instead of destructive. So, uh, so Dragon Rouge feel, filled an important path to uh, make people uh, uh, that maybe uh, otherwise would be a little bit lost in life uh, found, find uh, a track uh, and a path to go on and they also improve as human beings. So, but they, of course, it, it, the, the Clifford are surrounded with this. If you study Clifford, it is, uh, they are horrifying. It's, it's uh, we're dealing with, with the death and our own death. And we will, it is frightening, but we are not dealing with it because we want to scare someone or scare ourselves or, or or uh, it, it, it doing something destructive or evil. We do it for the sake of self-improvement and also so that we can be a, a, a constructive part of the society where we live. And what fascinates me is that, that uh, Latin America, as I said in general, and Brazil in particular, is where we grow the most. And it's something that makes me very happy because it's a little bit like the, the Northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere uh, connect with each other and uh, so so I find it very interesting from many perspectives both cultural and uh, and and magical uh, and then this Kravi had a question to say Mr. Carlson you frequently mention Atlantis in your works what is your interpretation of the myths uh, what does the magician have to gain by accessing it yeah, good question. Atlantis is uh, like the optimal uh, myth that have a bit of the same message as the story of Garden of Eden. Because in the myth of Atlantis, uh, how it, it has been, uh, been uh, it started with Plato, but then uh, there have been a long uh, literature tradition of, of Atlantis and been also part of, of many occult uh, writings and societies. But Atlantis fell into the ocean uh, because they started to have draconian priests and priestesses. And they had a sacred fire in the center of Atlantis. And when the waves came and swept away Atlantis, 
some of the priests or one of the priests was succeeded to carry on this torch and then gave it onwards and this torch have then passed through the ages uh, and is still burning so it's a very important myth uh, for um, how we operate and Atlantis in itself represents the fifth dimension it is uh, by this Atlantis cross uh, in a beautiful way with all its circles also show paths to up and down and to, to right and left uh, so the Atlantis is the fifth dimension, uh, also known as Tagirion or the Black Sun, uh, or, and it's a solar sphere with the number 666. I have a question for Daniel. You, you said that something about the 11th di dimension. It's possible to make a very brief description about each one. Does they rela re re are related? Um, in some ways to the spheres of the Kabbalah. Yeah, they do. They uh, relate completely to the cliff art. Uh, and uh, the best way to understand uh, these dimensions is to think that we live in a two-dimensional reality, like in a cartoon. Uh, it would be impossible for us to really understand the third dimension with space if we live in, in a flat dimension, uh, like in a cartoon. There is actually a very great uh, 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 episode of, of uh, Simpsons when Homer Simpsons enter into the third dimension. Uh, it's actually both fun, but it also gives us a little bit of, of uh, food for thought about how it is to enter into dimensions that we can't relate to. Because if you have lived all your life in a, in a like flat dimension, uh, two, to, uh, uh, in, in a two-dimensional reality, it will be very, very hard to even think about our dimension with three, di where we have space, where we can move in all directions. And the same is with the fifth dimension. When you reach it, it, you, it, it takes a long time to, to melt it, to understand it, because it's so, it's it like you, you get access to so much more uh, than, than you can experience in the four dimensional reality. So, not least because of that, I also feel it's a little bit of a mission for myself uh, to, to uh, inspire people to uh, work towards a fifth dimensional reality, because I also think it's good for mankind, because we will then uh, create a kind of a mega brain. And that's why I also uh, started up this global united night side, that uh, like-minded people, we can connect, we can get these cumulative effects of learning from each other. And uh, that network, uh, can become something that really uh, become a revolutionary for mankind. So we enter and get access to, to knowledges that's been hidden before. Uh, and the, the cliffhotic path is to step by step by step in a controlled way, uh, enter into the, the hidden dimensions. That's nice. I have a this is other question. Uh, Kusta asked yeah. me to ask you about the Utark. Uh, yeah. What's the difference between the, the Futark and the Utark? And what was the story behind this book? Yeah. Uh, for some reasons, uh, the Swedish runologist, he was actually a professor in Slavic languages, uh, Sigurd Agrell, uh, in the early uh, 20th century. Uh, wrote a lot of books where he compared the runes and, and uh, he, he was a very imaginative runologist and he compared uh, the runes with the initiation rites of the Mitras cult in the Roman Empire and with the Isis cult and with uh, different late antique uh, initiation cults and so patterns that they correlated well with each other. And his basic idea is that uh, 
if you move the first rune uh, to, to the, the end, you like uh, open up uh, the esoteric aspects of the runes from uh, otherwise being more just uh, uh, an alphabet for, for writing. But by putting the first rune there to the end, he meant that uh, that is the way to understand uh, runes from an esoteric perspective. But since I'm also a friend with Dr. Stephen Flowers, who uh, work uh, only with the food hark uh, system, I also see uh, benefits in working with the, with the food hark. So it's not that I say that you should only work with the food hark. I see you can work with both, especially if you put the runes in a circle, then uh, you get a lot of understanding of how the runes uh, are operating because then the last and the first room become next to each other when you place the, all the rooms in a circle. That's great. Uh, I have a question from Flavio. He said, if you yeah. are you familiar, familiarized with the mythology of the Orishas? You have been to Brazil recently. Yeah. Uh, I would say it was in the, during the COVID. So I believe you, you haven't visited any Umbanda or Kimbanda or Candomblé terreros. I, no? I, I actually had, but I, it was the, uh, two years ago when I was in Brazil. So I have visited the, such uh, ceremonies, which are beautiful and extremely powerful. Uh, and my wife is from Brazil and she is studying uh, on a very high level. Uh, the mysteries of, of the Afro-Brazilian uh, uh, mystery cults. So I am familiar with it, but I would say I'm humble uh, enough to understand that I, 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 I know uh, a bit, but I'm far from being an expert in, in those fields. But I'm extremely fascinated by it and, uh, and enjoy to read about it. And I hope to learn much more about it in the future. Yeah, I would, I would ask you about the connection between the Orishas and the Clifford or the spheres. In Brazil, we had some uh, Tejeros that work with the Kabbalah and they have the connection. So they say, oh, Yemanja, it's related to Yesod, so you have a shoe related to Hod or something like that. You're not familiar with this. No. Uh, and and I, I also think that one should be careful when you make uh, uh, correspondences between different systems because it's, it sometimes can take you a little way, a bit away from your path. It can be fruitful. For example, for me, by studying uh, the Indian goddess Kali, I have got a lot of understanding of, of uh, Lilith. So it can be fruitful to, 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 uh, to uh, look at different traditions because they can give you a higher understanding of the different deities. But it can also uh, make you come a little bit uh, wrong because it can be that they are not comp co compatible with each other. Uh, or, or at least the way you do it. So, so yeah, I, I can, can't give any comment or answer when it comes to that because uh, I haven't seen it and I don't know the quality of it, if it's good or bad. I can think that it could be good, but, but I don't know uh, enough about it to have an opinion. And then we have another opinion on spirituality. The, the question is, do you, in Dragon Hush, do you have anything related to possession or contact with his spirits or anything like that? Yes. Uh, our fourth degree is very much about that kind of, uh, of uh, uh, experiences. Uh, we go into sometimes uh, what can be compared to the Indian tradition of bhakti, of complete devotion. Uh, and in that you can also experience demonic possessions in a voluntary way, which is something that can be extremely positive as in voodoo, for example. Uh, you are like uh, riding the, the, the horses of the gods. Uh, we have it also in the Nordic tradition in something called Seid. Uh, 
And uh, the fourth uh, initiation is very much about uh, this kind of things. Uh, so if our system is that the first thing you do is that you, you enter up the veil and you get a little bit of a glimpse on the other side. Then you take a step in, then you meet uh, the, the, your first meeting with the other side. Then you go in to make a kind of an intellectual study. So you have an intellectual foundation. Uh, and that's something you do uh, through uh, sharing knowledge with other people in Dragon Ocean. You, you get a mentor that also can, can help you. And then when you have your intellectual foundation and you, you feel stable in your intellectual understanding of the mysteries, then you throw yourself into devotion instead. That is completely unintellectual. That is really the fire, the possession, uh, the, the ecstatic uh, meeting with, with, uh, with the, the deities. Uh, quite often in a, in a bit of an erotic way. All right. And another two questions about the dragon rouge. Dimitri said, uh, what about enteogenic substances in magic ritual? What's your point of view about it? About? Uh, enteogenics. Oh, okay, Unless yeah. <laughs> I would uh, say that if you're familiar with it and can deal with it and are into a tradition uh, uh, where it's a part of the tradition, I would say that that uh, it can have a, a place, but it's at the same time very risky. So for a modern person, maybe living in the city, uh, dealing with this kind of things can be extremely frightening and also be, I would say, one should be very careful. So you must really know what you're doing if you uh, use these kind of things. But I don't say it's wrong. Uh, it can be right, but it must be under circumstances uh, that uh, you don't lose your path. And actually, I would say you should wait until you are 25, until you uh, try anything like that, because it's when you're 25, uh, the frontal cortex is, uh, is developed and uh, it, it's less likely that you uh, uh, lose control. And uh, this is actually based upon a professor uh, that uh, had a uh, son that was a member of Dragon Rouge. And this professor was uh, a professor in psychology. And uh, his son, a very, very fun and great guy, when he was like 20, he asked his father, what do you think about I would eat the magic mushrooms, you know, the psilocybin mushrooms. And his father looked at him, yeah, but you must wait until you're 25 because your brain is not uh, fully developed yet. So uh, uh, if you're going to do, uh, try magic mushrooms, wait until you're 25. So uh, uh, I would say it's very much based upon the context and that one should be extremely careful and, uh, and it's definitely not for, for, uh, yeah, for uh, two young people. And uh, it should be in a tradition where people know what they are doing. The reason I asked you is because here in Brazil, we have the ayahuasca and jurema and uh, yeah. <laughs> several cults. I, I don't know. Next time you come to Brazil, we'll take you to an, uh, one of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They want to you know what are the, the connection between the Cliffords and ayahuasca that would be very nice to see. Uh, I know a lot of people who have experienced really like the red dragon when they have um, uh, drink ayahuasca. So uh, it, uh, as far as I know, it has very strong uh, draconian uh, properties. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and Kusa asks you, uh, can you tell a little bit more about the usage of runes inside the Dragon Rouge? Uh, runes, it's one of the main uh, systems that we work with. And uh, uh, it gives us 
uh, access to knowledge that we uh, otherwise uh, might be hard to find. Uh, because in the runic system, we find more or less exact the same things as you find in the Indian tradition, uh, but in a little different way. So uh, if you're doing different Indian uh, types of mysticism, uh, the runes can give you access to a perhaps deeper level or at least uh, equally deep. So uh, the runes are patterns in the web of destiny and uh, through the runes we have the possibility to uh, uh, do some action and that actually uh, influence destiny a little bit in accordance to our will. So uh, the runes are, are uh, optimal uh, uh, and simple uh, uh, symbols for uh, for uh, dealing with the web of destiny. That's great. We almost get to the end of the interview, and I have to ask yeah. you a question that I ask all religions leaders that I yeah. interview. And based on your experience, in your particular view, what do you think happens after we die? Uh, this is not anything that is a dogma of Dragarosh. So this is just my, my, my personal opinion. But uh, uh, I'm very sure that uh, we live after that, that uh, th this uh, existence is a part of a huge chain of, of different uh, incarnations and can also be that we spend uh, a lifetime in, in let's say, uh, the seventh dimension instead of the fourth dimension. Uh, so uh, uh, for me personally, uh, I strongly believe that there is a life after death. Well, and how can we find you? Your books uh, we have in Portuguese. I, uh, I'll put the links in the description. Great. Yeah. Uh, uh, how can you find? Because since we are podcasts, you have to say the links and everything for the our listeners. Yeah, uh, I would say you can find me on Facebook, and then you uh, write my name, and then you should search for the Thomas Carlson with an umbrella. It was uh, taken with by a Norwegian uh, professional artist for an exhibition, uh, so we uh, made it look really like uh, could be something from Friedrich Nietzsche. I was standing there in black suit and with a shovel and an umbrella. So it was actually an art picture, but that's the one that uh, I use on Facebook. Uh, so people can write an a PM to me there. I must just say that I get a lot of messages, almost 100 messages per day. Uh, so I read everything, but uh, it can take some time before I reply. But uh, if you have musical projects, if you have uh, have uh, suggestions of, of inviting me for, for workshops or if you have uh, art uh, projects, uh, please send it to me and uh, we can have some conversation about it. Then it's of course also the Dragarouche uh, website, which is uh, uh, yeah, www.dragarouche.se. Uh, there was a question that I forgot. Uh, how can we enter Dragon Rouge? What does uh, someone has to do? You just enter in, in contact and, and you uh, you send an uh, yeah you, you send a, a presentation of yourself uh, on workmail.dr at uh, gmail.com and uh, you, you want to actually also just send a picture of, of an ID. It's because we don't want any trolls, so to speak. We want that, that uh, know that it's real people who apply. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, we are 100%, you know, uh, we never leave out any information at all. So people can be members of Dragon Ocean and, and feel that, uh, that it, 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 it's yeah, something just between the order and them. Then you have one year's prospectus. Uh, we check that, that everything works fine and that you seem to be a reliable person. And uh, if everything turns fine, which it often do, uh, you become then a full member uh, after one year. So uh, that's the process. 
and that uh, we are constantly developing our website uh, and we will we will work to have more music more guided meditations uh, art uh, uh, literature etc etc on on um, on our website and we have now quite soon seven draconian workings which are great for you who want to quick come into the draconian system so uh, look for it uh, at my uh, facebook site uh, and uh, and uh, i would strongly recommend that uh, you uh, uh, yeah join these seven workshops that will be on zoom or skype this is uh, my dog. Yeah, it, because we are usually, nice. usually record at night when she's sleepy. So now, <laughs> don't worry, I will, I will edit it, it. it. <laughs> it's Kerber, it's Kerberos, uh, the, the dog of hell, who is uh, yeah. guard, guarding the entrance. Yes. <laughs> uh, is there any groups of the, dra the Dragon Rouge in Brazil? Do you have physical gatherings? And how is it not yet? COVID? Not yet, but uh, that's something we uh, uh, are going to develop now. We uh, put in, out info about it uh, the last weeks because now we feel it's time to uh, make people gather in uh, kind of working groups. It should not be separate lodges. Uh, it, it, it should be strongly connected that that we all. Uh, work inside the same unit, Dragon Rouge, but that there is a, a possibility to, to meet uh, other members uh, in, in the country where you live. So uh, it's something that's uh, yeah going on right now. Well, I guess it's thank you so much for your time. You have lots of fans in Brazil. We hope you can bring you back to Brazil for some time next year or the other. Here we are stuck, we have a shitty president and we don't have vaccines or anything. <laughs> well, I believe it, uh, for the symposium would be like 23. <laughs> but we really want to have you back in Brazil. Thank you yeah, so yeah. much. And thanks for inviting me. And, uh, and uh, uh, also thanks to all the uh, listener uh i hope you enjoyed this and uh, don't hesitate to contact me and uh yeah finally i must from the depth of my heart say that i really love brazil all right e para você que estava seguindo a gente não esquece de dar like segue o canal que essa foi a entrevista número 150 comemorativa então nós temos mais 150 entrevistas e a gente se vê de novo no próximo bate-papo mayhem